Your Excellency, many Catholics have noted how the leadership of the Society of St. Pius X has largely fallen silent on the various errors of Pope Bergoglio, even though they are much worse and more brazen than those of Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI, and that they barely resisted the tyrannical shutdown of churches during the Covid pseudo-pandemic two years ago. How did this spirit of compromise with the modern world enter the society, and when did you begin to notice it? Um, it's, I, for, a lot, for a while, I didn't notice it. Uh, I was certainly not one of the first ones to notice it. But there has been a change of spirit, there's no doubt about that. And the spirit of combat, the fighting spirit, has diminished. Uh, broadly speaking, the, I think that the society has lost the spirit of Archbishop Lefebvre. Uh, it, keep, it has kept up the admirable standards of many of the admirable standards in the practice of priests and the practice of seminaries, in its seminaries and in its priests. But those are externals rather than the internal spirit. And I think the internal spirit of the Archbishop is, is lit missing. And I think it's missing, I think I was saying earlier, uh, but it doesn't matter because you can edit everything. Um, I think it's missing because the seminarians uh, at the beginning may have been born like Father Schmidberg in the 40s or several in the 50s. When the seminary began in the 70s, several seminarians were born in the 40s or 50s. But a few years later, 10 years later, they will be born in the 50s and 60s. Another 10 years later in the 60s and 70s. The, 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 the vocations entering the society seminaries have been more and more up-to-date, obviously, um, more and more modern, and therefore more and more exposed to the general cultural and intellectual collapse and moral collapse of the West over these last, 50, let's, say, let's say, 2020, 70, 50 years. Uh, in the 70s and the 80s, the Archbishop could still get seminarians born and bred before the Council. But uh, from when the Archbishop died in 1991, the seminarians were uh, born more and more from 1970 onwards, which means that they were children of the post-Council. As children of the post-Council world, they were exposed from, from when they were born and bred to this degraded world, this degraded post-conciliar world. And if they were born and bred in a traditional Catholic family um, and put in society schools so that they were largely protected, apparently, from the modern world, Nevertheless, uh, man is a social animal, he's not just a familial animal, and therefore as children of their society, these youngsters were exposed to the modern world and it seeped into them. And as it seeped into them, they had less and less understanding for the preconciliar archbishop, or what the preconciliar archbishop was really about. And they had less and less cultural faith or they had less and less sense of a society's order. And a schoolboy in a school, you could build 10 foot high walls all around the school and still the boys will pick up the vibes of what's going on outside. The boys growing up, they've got antennae and they're picking this up. And as they absorb this, I think fewer and fewer had that old-fashioned faith of the Archbishop with which they could understand the Archbishop. 
And I didn't, when I was a seminary, I didn't have the old-fashioned faith because it was a convert. But I did have a decent education again. And um, I was, my education was over by the early, uh, early uh, 60s. Uh, I finished, I ex uh, exited Cambridge 19, in 1961, which means that I still had a sense of the general, of social order from the world that was still in social order prior to the Beatles, prior to the 60s. I, I was not, I was formed largely before the 1960s, so I, I had some, I, some ancient idea of the ancient archbishop simply by my age. Whereas the other members of the society, many of them, were rather younger than I was. I was a late vocation. And they were more exposed to the modern world and had less understanding of the archbishop as the archbishop. And I think I was saying the other day, they, they entered the society, the, the first seminaries entered the society because they were looking for a continuation of the 1950s. If they were born... If they were exposed to the 1950s and had some order of the 1950s, some sense of the order of the 1950s, they, they wanted a seminary of the 1950s. And they were in, all of the other seminaries were, were modernized by Paul VI. And the, it's only the Archbishop who started his seminary in 1970, his main seminary in 1970. And therefore he, had a, he was the only one who had a 50s seminary after the council. And if these seminarians were looking for a 50s seminary, then what they were following in the Archbishop was the Archbishop of the 1950s and not the Archbishop of the faith that was going to surpass the 1950s and continue into the 70s and 80s. Therefore, they didn't understand what the Archbishop was about. They... they, they how can I say, they were following him as children of the 50s to continue the 1950s. But the 1950s had in the germ the 1960s. Therefore, these seminarians were in the 50s seminary of the Archbishop with a desire of the 1950s. They were in the apparently continuing 1950s seminary of the Archbishop with desires of the 19. 60s, 70s. Therefore, they were liberals waiting to show their liberalism. And when the Archbishop was no longer there with his tremendous faith, even the Archbishop was what I call fifties-ist to a certain extent, to a little extent, to no serious extent, but he was a little fifties-ist. You know, there's a little clinging on to this the externals and not the internals. But his strong faith was absolutely the internals of the Catholic faith. So you may, one may criticize the Archbishop of Enlice, but, but not too much, because what he did was stupendous to establish, to, to give um, uh, citizenship, to, to give citizenship back to rights of citizenship, back to tradition after the council. When the council, when the council did everything it could to destroy tradition. And the conciliar church joined in the, the witch hunt for, the, for tradition. And he was on his own. He was standing on his own. To do, to, and to establish tradition in an anti-traditional modern world, an anti-traditional conciliar world, stupendous feat. So it's not worth criticizing the Archbishop for, for details, but I think, in fact, he was a little 50sist. But in any case, the seminaries, these, his first seminaries were um, pre, of a preconciliar origin, but with 50sist instincts, which led to, to, to back to the council. So uh, when he was no longer there, these children of the 1950s wanted to go back to the 1950s, and the 1950s carried in German the 1960s. Therefore, there was not the same resistance of the, of the Archbishop's strong faith to the revolution of the 1960s. I'm sorry, that's all very confused and, 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 and complicated, but how can I sum it up? I try and sum it up. The, the, the seminarians, his seminarians were 
either preconcilia, but waiting to, 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 to go with the conciliar world, with the conciliar world in germ, because the 50s were so close to the 60s. Or they were post-60s, in which case they were exposed to the whole modern post-conciliar world. Therefore, they did not have, most of them didn't, a lot of them did not have a, a real grip on what the Archbishop was really about, which was the faith. His concern was the faith. That's why he seemed to, he seemed to zigzag. I know Bishop Sanborn always says the Archbishop zigzagged. Because for one, one, at one moment the Archbishop was trying to talk with the Romans, and another moment he was absolutely refusing to talk with the Romans. Talk, refuse, talk, refuse, zigzag, zigzag. But when he was talking with the Romans, he was trying to get the Romans to, to do their Catholic duty to look after tradition, which is what they're for, because the Catholic religion is tradition. Um, okay. And when he was not talking with the Romans, he was protecting the faith. So whether he was trying to get the Romans to do their duty to protect the faith, or whether he was himself protecting the faith against their, 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 their felony, um, he was in any case defending the faith. The faith came absolutely first and always, and the doctrine of the faith with the archbishop. But the youngsters today have generally no sense of truth. Little, they've got this mush, mush, mushy sense of truth and this mushy sense of doctrine. And they haven't got the basics for a strong, clear faith. Two, you know, in their heads, two and two are not necessarily four. They, they, they observe all the externals of two and two or four, but they've not understood the essentials of two and two or four, which is objective truth, which is absolutely exclusive of error. Therefore, they have no longer that fighting spirit against error, and they're no longer fighting against the, the modern world, with the wicked modern world, the COVID, the, the COVID fraud modern world. They're not fighting it. They've, got this, they've not got the spirit to fight against that. And they haven't got the spirit to fight for the uh, old-fashioned exclusive faith. They've got this desire for inclusiveness and love. And, um, there are some good priests in the society, and, and there are... But another thing, of course, is that, that the Archbishop always... His, his, his operation always suffered from not having the approval of the Pope. So when the Archbishop died, by an instinct, the, the, the leadership of the society wanted to go back under the Pope. They wanted to go back to the Pope. I can remember there was a quarrel in the society around 2004, and Arch Bishop Foley was at, at, at loggerheads with a particular French priest, and he wanted to appeal to higher authority to settle the quarrel. That's the most normal thing in the world for a Catholic. But in order to, that's like asking the fox to argue, to arrange an argument between the chickens. The fox will eat them both if he can. If he gets the opportunity, he's going to eat them both. He couldn't care less about a quarrel between the chickens. So it's, it's a foolishness to apply to these Romans. But he was doing it out of, out of a Catholic instinct. He was appealing to higher authority, which he should have been able to appeal to. But it's a, it's a real lack of realism on the part, I think, honestly, on the part of Bishop Foley. It's a real lack of realism, reality, uh, to appeal to the Romans to settle a, a Catholic quarrel. They're going to settle it in the wrong way because they're anti-faith. They're anti Yes, I. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, then that's my uh, my basic sort of answer to why the society has gone off track. Without the Archbishop, I would say it was virtually inevitable. What's remarkable is how long the society survived without major upset uh, after his death. And I was certainly the Romans, with their 2,000 years of experience, were just waiting for the society to go soft without its charismatic leader, charismatic in the true sense, without its extraordinary leader, the extraordinary churchman. But, the, but for God's purposes, the Archbishop did his essential work by um, spearheading the return of tradition. 
And that's how actually Vigano put it in one of his recent declarations. He, he re-established the rights of tradition to exist in the church. And now tradition is seeping everywhere. It's not conquering, but it is seeping. And it's spreading everywhere. I mean, for instance, at the, at the consecrations um, in 1988 of four bishops, immediately there was a break-off from the society of about 15 priests. And I thought, and they formed the Society of St. Peter, which was an imitation of SSPX. I thought they were, they were traitors, but that's, I think, unfair. I think that while objectively they were no longer taking the line of the Archbishop, I think they were, they were going from Catholic truth back towards Catholic authority, but they were trying to be Catholic. They thought the Archbishop had gone too far in breaking away from authority by consecrating bishops without the bishop's permission of Rome. I'm sure they were wrong, but they were trying to be Catholic. I think today you have to make serious allowances for somebody who wants to be Catholic. I think wanting to be Catholic today is a large part of being Catholic. The major part is doctrine. Still, it still is doctrine. It's faith which makes a Catholic and doctrine which makes the faith. So doctrine is what makes Catholics and what made the Archbishop so strong as he was. Uh, his, his grasp of doctrine, thanks to his seminary formation. But he, the, you know, he, at the one point, he was dealing with the, the Bishop of Strasbourg in France, a, a Monsignor Elchinger, with whom he was at the French seminary in Rome. And he was Monsignor Elchinger, a member of the establishment, a member of the system, obedient to the system, staying within the system, practicing the new religion, stamping on the old religion. And he was a, had been a buddy of the Archbishop of the Seminary. And the Archbishop was taking, taking the line, no, I can't go by the authority. I, I've got to go by truth, because truth is the very purpose of authority. So the Archbishop was... was for, faithful to the very purpose and spirit of authority, but not to the appearances, the, the, the man dressed in white and, uh, and the system dressed up as system. But he saw through it into what mattered, which was the faith. And he preserved the faith and he preserved tradition. Without the archbishop, where would tradition be in the church today? Now, as it's, it's, now it's seeping everywhere because nobody essentially didn't, well, You've got uh, Pope Bergoglio, uh, Traditionis Custodes, trying to stamp out tradition with Traditionis Custodes, with that terrible declaration on, you know, trying to exterminate the old mass. He's got no right to do that. The Pope, even the Pope has no right to do that. The Pope is the servant of the faith. He's not the fabricator of the faith. That's what these Popes don't see. They're so full with authority and the desire to fit the modern world and their authority to change the church. And that's, that's a problem because, um, I mean, you might, again, going into fundamentals, where did this valorize, this lifting authority above truth come from? Where did, the, where did the idea come from that the Catholic religion is more authority than it is faith? And you'd have to, I think you have to say it began with the Protestantism because Protestantism is subtle error and the, temp, the temptation ever since, ever since Protestantism has been for the Catholic Church to say to, to Catholics, follow us and we'll take you to heaven. Follow us, follow us, follow us. You're not going to understand the, the ins and outs of Lutheran theology and so on. So just follow us, trust us and we'll take you to heaven. That's not actually what uh, often the, the, the Catholic Churchman did say. Um, this is the truth. Here are the arguments. Here is the doctrine. Here is tradition. This is what you must follow. This is what we're standing for. You must obey us, and we will, take you, we will keep you in the truth and take you to heaven. But the temptation is to say, obey, obey, obey. Pay, pray, and obey. 
as the formula is in the United States. Don't worry about the truth. Just pay, pray, and obey. Give us the collection on Sunday. Uh, be docile and pray and be good boys and just obey us and that'll everything will be fine. That's the temptation. And that began, I think, that broadly began with Protestantism. Prior to Protestantism, the truth was just just automatically assumed to, to prevail. But Protestantism laid a, a big booby trap in the way of the truth. It was a tremendous, a, com, a compound heresy, a, a huge dimensions. So... What comments do you have regarding the dubia cardinals who have appeared to offer some resistance to Pope Francis' program of further neo-modernism? They were good. They, they, they have a grasp on the truth. They're, they were old men. Uh, two of them have died since, two of the four. I forget the names of all four. I think Brandt, Muller and Burke are still alive. All hats off to them. Plenty of courage because they were defying Pope Bergoglio. And they came under the hammer for it. He's never answered them, which is significant and sinister. He's never tried to answer them. They were unanswerable. They were, they were speaking up for tradition. But they, they, they hardly, they don't seem to have got anywhere because they, they, there was no, means, no way for them to follow up. What could they do to follow up except start a congregation like the Archbishop did in 1970? But they had no, there was no movement of backup from the rest of the cardinals. I dare say some of them telephoned privately to one another. They said, well, I completely agree with you. But, the, but they, the other, all of the other cardinals would not come out in public. They won't defy the system. Again, it's the authority over, it's authority over the truth. These four all had a grip on the truth. Hats off. At least they were not Kantians or modernists. They're good men. But they, they still had, in a way, too much respect for authority. I think Cardinal Burke has continued to rear in the shafts, which is, a, you know, the horse rears up in the shafts. Um, he's reared up for the sake of truth. He's stood up for the truth in other cases, but he hasn't been able to achieve very much simply because the mass of cardinals don't follow. The mass of cardinals are stuck with the system, with authority, and then, of course, a number of the cardinals will be Freemasons themselves. And they are going to, uh, and the Freemasons have taken care to occupy the, the real posts of command, and therefore the church is in the hands of the Freemasons, and the good men are isolated and paralyzed. But I think they're four good men, and it, it's, the system, is, the system is too far gone. The system is in the hands of the enemy, and the system is powerful. It's been in the hands of the enemy for many years. It, the takeover was in what, Vatican II. And the fault of especially Pope John XXIII and Pope Paul VI, who, who, because the Archbishop always said, at, at Vatican II, he, he said more or less, there were 2,000 bishops. Um, how many did he say? 200 were traditional. 200 were liberal, liberal, and the other 14, the other 1600 were swaying between the two, and that 1600 followed the popes, John the 23rd and then Paul the 6th, and John the 23rd and Paul the 6th were put in place, chosen carefully, and put in place by the Masons, and with their power, and therefore um, the 600 swayed with the 1600 swayed with liberalism. And that was the end of the council. And the popes, the archbishop, the popes were responsible, mainly responsible. He says at the end of the council, there were 400 good bishops who were resolved to stand together. But the Pope Paul VI arm wrestled them down and broke them up. And some died, some he... he he dismissed, and so on and so on, and he, he overcame the resistance to his, his revolution. God allowed it, 
punishment for the church and punishment for the world. Just punishment. The world, not the bishops not praying enough, the bishop and Carlos not praying enough, as St. Thomas More said of the English bishops of the Reformation, and wanting to go with the world, loving the world. And St. James says in Scripture, he who loves the world is an enemy of God. And so they had a loss of faith, basically a loss of faith in the bishops, because the bishops were too exposed to the world or exposed themselves too much to the world and were not praying enough. A number of faithful associated with the society have commented on the steady softening of the society's tone and rhetoric towards modernism and the modern world, even as the situation grows more and more grave. In what ways is a traditional cause at risk of being assimilated to the modern world? A considerable risk, because the, the representatives of tradition, of tradition, the champions of tradition, are all human beings with original sin in a wicked and corrupting world. If, if, if God hadn't flooded out the world, it would have all gone to hell at the time of the deluge. They would all, and if, if God doesn't intervene today, or if it doesn't intervene soon, one would say, whatever soon means, if he doesn't intervene soon, I'm not sure there'll still be resistance. I'm not sure there'll be anything left of the SSBX, except appearances. The resistant priests who lack authority, because it, you can't fabricate authority out of thin air. Authority comes from God or it really doesn't come. Now, in the Catholic Church, authority comes through the Pope. Now, Almighty God is looking after his church in various, new, various original ways and various unauthoritative ways without the help of the church's own proper authority, which does lie with the officially elected cardinals and the officially appointed bishops and the, uh, the at least apparently chosen elected pope. He's, he, he's the one who apparently has the real church authority. Whether he really has it or not, that's an open question. But uh, because he's so bad, he's so destructive of the church, traditionis custodis, but... The, the real authority then is in the hands of enemies of the church. And that's not a normal situation for Catholics, not at all. Popes may have had several children scattered around all over Rome. Uh, they've been naughty boys and they've had children, but they could still administer in accordance with the faith. They could still have the faith and they could still administer it and, and the church would survive. But the church cannot survive, as, can hardly survive, God is God. The church can hardly survive a series of um, popes saying two and two is four and or five. A series of six popes saying that two and two are four or five. The church can't survive that if it goes on indefinitely. God has got to intervene. He really has to. We, and, but we need to beg him to intervene. It's only when enough Catholics want his kind of pope that he will give it. Oh, it's a waste of time. Maybe John Paul I was going to be his kind of pope. He was shaping up to come down, to crack down on some Masons who he found out to be Masons high up in the church. The Masons killed him before he dismissed them. They poisoned him. They killed him. It's every likelihood. Um, so... If you haven't got the setting, if you haven't got a, a good, a strong setting, you're going to lose the stone. If you haven't got enough support for a good pope, it's no use giving a good pope because the, the man, the mankind will throw him away or kill him. So you, you need, there's got to be a conversion and a conversion of many human beings. Enough Catholics have got to convert and beg God for the right kind of Pope, for him to grant it, otherwise there's just not going to be the setting to hold the good Pope, and man, they will kill him or corrupt him or whatever. 
Could you comment on the seductive glamour and stickiness of the modern world and how this contributes to imperiling souls? Well, I would, in brief, um, the industrialism creates a soft and sensual way of life with the help of machines. The di diesel, diesel takes the muscular work out of life. Diesel oil takes, takes the, the, the hard work out of life. The machine, together with the machines, like the washing machine, takes the, the, the toughness out of the life of the housewife. Um, the diesel tractors take the, 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 much of the hard life on the farm. Um, the, the, the man no longer has, needs the strength to hold a horse with a plow. So, which she could never do because she hasn't the strength. The woman hasn't the physical strength. So she has to respect her husband because of his physical strength, without which there would be no plowing and no bread for the winter. So she's bound to respect him when he's out there in the fields with all his strength, using or deploying all his strength in order to do his work. He has to respect her when she's spending all day with her sleeves rolled up, uh, washing and cleaning and, 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 and cooking and so on. So when life is hard, marriages hold together. But when life is soft, marriages and the family won't hold together. So the whole structure and texture of modern life is dissolving those elements which hold together the natural family life which is favorable to God and to the interests of God and to getting to heaven. So it's, it's a whole texture. And industrialism followed Protestantism. So it was the breakaway from God that made men turn to machines and the machines are not healthy for man's life. And the machines, uh, there is a prophecy that the chastisement is going to cancel machines. The trouble is that with men's free will, they will come back. And what makes them come back? Pride and sensuality, the two great arch sins, if you like. Pride because I'm right, uh, it's making me rear up against God. Sensuality, because it's making me prefer things which are sinful in the eyes of God. So both things, pride and sensuality, the second and third sorrowful mysteries of the rosary, our Lord's scourging and our Lord's crowning with thorns. He who is pe doing penance or, or expiating those sins of all mankind, those two great sins. You, you might call them the two arch sins. That's not language of the church. No, nobody talks about two arch sins, but pride is undoubtedly the greatest and worst of the sins. And modern life um, enables and encourages pride. It enables one to think that man is, is, is the one who, who does everything and, and God, God is no longer needed. And therefore, everything that, that make, builds man's self-esteem and the belief that, he, that he's independent, he can be independent, he doesn't need to depend, that's bad. And everything like pornography and so on and so on and so on that encourages and makes so easy and possible sensuality and, and sensual sin, it's everywhere, you know, it's all over the place today. That killer, what was his name? I, um, it's on the tip of my tongue, but I've lost it. Ted Bundy. Yes, dead right. Ted Bundy. Uh, Ted Bundy said there are hundred. Well, there are there are many people, many men just like me in all the towns of the United States, and they're on that path: soft pornography to hard pornography to crime, serial killing. It's it's a progress, but basically it's the world, the flesh, and the devil, which is you know what it, which is what the three great enemies that always have been ever since Adam and Eve of of salvation, enemies of God, and governing the modern, running the modern world. And then this instrument of all of these, these weaknesses of, in human beings, starting with original sin, which was not God's fault, uh, it, my mind, I've forgotten what I was trying to say. Um, I've just clean forgotten. Go on. 
In his encyclical Quod Apostolici Muneris in 1878, Pope Leo XIII spoke of, quote, the secret societies in whose bosom the seeds of the errors which we have already mentioned were even then being nourished, end quote. Freemasonry was the subject of more encyclicals and more condemnations than any other group. But since the Vatican II concordat with the modern world, the bishops have fallen silent on this threat to the universal church. How did this silence come about and what have been the effects of it? Well, it's come about because many of the bishops and cardinals are masons themselves. And with, again, living the modern life, living in the modern world, Masonic ideals seem absolutely normal. You see the text of Pope Bergoglio's uh, consecration, in inverted commas, of Russia and the Ukraine, or Ukraine and Russia, to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. It's full of liberty, equality, fraternity. Gaudium et Spes, the, the, one of the major documents, uh, one of the most typical, perhaps the most typical document, together with the re religious liberty of Vatican II, um, re Gaudium et Spes is full of liberty, equality, fraternity. It's Masonic in thinking, it's saturated in Masonry. And the modern world is saturated in Masonry. And that text of the consecration is liberty, equality, fraternity. Again. You know, as Pope Bergoglio thinks like a thinks like a Freemason, whether or not he is one, he thinks like one, and that's what the Masons said in the 19th century that they wanted. They said, "We want a Pope who thinks like us, but not necessarily a Pope is one of us, because if he isn't one of us, he'll be more convincing in his presentation of the treachery. If he is one of us, he will know that there's treachery involved." That we, are, that we are enemies of the church, that we're out to destroy the church. That's our business, those are our principles, and that's what we're doing. But if he's not a Mason, if he's unconsciously a Mason, he'll be liberty, liberty equality, fraternity, in all goodwill. Father Faber said that the end of the world will be characterized by men doing evil, thinking they're doing good, false principles. Masonry. And that's now a number of priests of the society. They, they no longer think like Archbishop Lefebvre, but they're convinced that they're thinking well and correctly. They're, they're in goodwill. That's why it's difficult to hammer people in error today, because they're in such goodwill with their error. They really don't see the error. They, they, they've got no they got virtually no chance of seeing the error because everything they've been taught from childhood and so on and so on is, is, is this error. That truth doesn't matter, that God doesn't matter, and this life is up for grabs, what do you want to do with it? Liberty, equality, fraternity, and so on and so on. Most people are convinced of these, of these errors, which Leo XIII, those are the errors that Leo XIII was talking about, being fostered by masonry, coming from masonry, being promoted by masonry, and finally infecting, because they so infect the world, finally infecting the churchmen. And the churchmen are no longer taught in their seminaries that Freemasonry is, absolute, is objectively absolutely wicked. It is created and designed to destroy the church. Oh, no, they're not as bad as that, and so on and so on. And the, and the church doesn't hate the modern world like that. The modern world isn't as bad as that. The modern world is great, Paul VI. The modern world is great. He, he really thought it was. The church is great. I don't think there was no faith in Paul VI, but it, he was a torn man. That's what the Archbishop said about him. He was a torn man. He believed both in the modern world and in the Catholic Church without realizing that the two clash and can only clash, because the modern world is founded to be godless. It's founded on godless principles. It, it, from the modern world is the fight against God, the war on God. The war on God is the key to most everything that's happening today. But nobody dreams of it because nobody takes God seriously. Practically nobody takes God seriously any longer. So if you can't see how essential God is to human life, we li live and move and have our being in him, 
If you don't see that, like, like St. Therese of Lisieux saw it, and like the Archbishop saw it, if you can't see that dependency of man on God, every moment of his existence, to be able to lift his little finger, man needs God, as the first cause. Um, if you can't see that, how can you possibly think that the key to understanding all the problems of modern life is the absence of God? It's lost, lost, lost. Full fathom five, thy father lies, and those are cor and uh, what is it? So those are corals that were his eyes, or something. Uh, it's in the tempest. Full fathom five, the truth lies. It's deep under sea, and nobody, few people imagine that it can be that it can be there. That it is the truth. It's so discredited. How might you sketch the architecture of power in the world today? Infandum Regina Yubes Renovare Dolorum. O Queen, this is Aeneas at the beginning of the book two of the Aeneid. O Queen, you are ordering me to re renew an unspeakable grief. Uh, it's an unspeakable grief what's happened. Uh, it's unnameable. It's unnameable because it's due to a race which is in power and which is so powerful that if you name it without buying down and adoring, they will come after you, they will destroy your job, they will destroy your reputation, they will etc, etc, etc. So there are these people who are behind Freemasonry and who govern Freemasonry secretly. It's cleverly, very cleverly done. And who crucified our Lord Jesus Christ and who have tried to crucify his church through Freemasonry over the last 400 years. Um, 1717 to 2022 is now 400 years. Uh, but it was that, that same war started with the crucifixion. It was, and they've been trying that since the the Catholic Church is is the continuation of the incarnation, then just as they were absolutely against the incarnation, because he took away their temple, their priesthood, their sacrifice, their above all their standing as the people of God, their status as, as the chosen people. That, and they've never forgiven the church for doing that. They've never forgiven Christ for doing that ever since. They hate Christ ever since. They are the structure of power. And they, I'm not mentioning the fatal word, the fatal four-letter word, for, deliberately. Because um, <clears throat> they've, they've, they've got the laws that if you mention their name without adoring, you're an anti-Semite. And if you're an anti-Semite, you are a hate person, you're full of... They, and they make anti-hate laws, which the stupid Gentiles can't see through. They don't see what's behind it. They don't see who's behind it. They don't see what's behind it. They're clever. They're very clever. And they've got a grasp. They, they, they retain a good part uh, not the best part, but a good part of the gifts with which they were kitted out by Almighty God to provide the launching ramp for the New Testament and for Jesus Christ. And such was their quality that they generated a Blessed Virgin Mary. Imagine what it means for a race to generate somebody as perfect as, as blessed and perfect as, as the Blessed Virgin Mary, to provide all the human elements of a, of a Blessed Virgin Mary, which they did. That was their mission, to provide the launching ramp for the New Testament, which they did, not by the Pharisees, but by the fishermen and the tax collectors. Because God, Almighty God, our Lord, went to elements sane and healthy amongst the chosen people with which to choose, form his apostles and to start the church. And it worked. But quite, quite soon, the Gentiles took over the Gentiles, to begin with, were very good, um, generations of martyrs and so on. The, 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 it passed, the, the, the baton in the relay race passed to the Europeans after being in the Far East, uh, after being in the Middle East um, and North Africa, and then chased out of those parts of the world by the Muslims, 
set up by these people to be an enemy of the Christians. And they were hoping that the, the Mohammedans would give them Jerusalem. But, but in 638, I think it was, the Mohammedans took Jerusalem for themselves and set up their own religion. But the, the Quran was very possibly written by one of those people. They're clever. And they're very good at creating false religions. Um, they created communism, which is a false religion, a substitute religion. They created uh, Freemasonry. They created uh, socialism. They created capitalism. They are behind many of these, many false religions. Usually you will find them because of this tremendous motivation against our Lord Jesus Christ which is in the, and their pride. They have a tremendous pride. That's the structure of power. In one word, which is unnameable and unmentionable, they are the ones who hold the power. And the Freemasons are simply their unwitting instruments. The Freemasons think that they're going to triumph, but the, the, they, those people know that they are going to triumph, and they will walk all over the Masons. If the Masons pretend to set themselves up when the, those people will walk all over them. And those people intend to govern the world, to rule the world. They will succeed for three and a half years under the Antichrist at the very, at the very end of the world. The Antichrist will raise the most terrible persecution of all the history of the church at the end of the world. The end of the world will ge therefore generate for Almighty God and for heaven some of the greatest saints in all the history of the church because of the huge persecution, huge saints. So once again, it, it's all in God's hands. God is the one who really knows what he's doing. But he's allowing the power to these people to punish centuries and centuries of degeneracy, of apostasy, of less and less gentle apostasy. Now it's bitter apostasy. Um, he's, he's, he's allowing it. it it's, there's nothing unjust about it. He is omnipotent. He could stop all of the nonsense today just like that if he wanted to. But he, but he wouldn't, doesn't want to because once he let men free again, they would go back to their sins. A short-term conversion is just not worth it because it won't take men to heaven. If men fall back into their sin, it's better not to give them the grace. The, the, here is a great, some, some great mysteries of God. How and to who and when he gives his grace, only he can judge. Only he can judge. Only he can choose. Only he's got the power to do what he judges. But, and his, his, his choice is free. But um, men are also free. And men choose, and because of our weakness, and original sin and our personal sins, we keep choosing what's wrong. And God can't give us the grace if we're simply going to throw it away again. It, it's, our last condition is worse than our first. It's better if it hadn't given the grace. That's why people often pray, but they don't pray as they should. They may think they're asking for the grace. But if they're not asking in, in such a way that God knows that they will keep it, it may be better for God not to give it. And that's one reason why people don't get their prayers answered. But if there's a chance of their persevering and making good use of the grace, he'll be strongly inclined to give it. His mercy lasts, endureth forever. But modern man is not good. He's not reliable. He's faithless. He's unfaithful. <laughs>